And so that's all we need to do in order to gain in two thirds of the cases in order to make 6% return for every single trade. That's simply what we have to do. Incredible results with Terra Luna. This is what this video is about. We will look at a strategy with very mechanical rules, with clearly defined rules that bring us this kind of a return over here. So a pretty steady positive return trading Terra Luna. And the idea is that we want to buy whenever the price is comparatively oversold. And when you do this, you get a long-term appreciation without the risk, because that's the problem, right? When you just buy and hold the Luna token, you're exposed to a lot of volatility. You're exposed to a lot of downside temporarily. And that can be pretty tough on the psychology. It's pretty hard to hold an asset when temporarily it goes down by more than 80%. That's different to the return we see over here with the strategy. So in this video, I will show exactly how all of this is done. This is simply a simulation, right? I've backtested all of this. It's a mechanical strategy, buying and selling. So I hope you're going to enjoy this. All of this will be in this video. Now, finding opportunities in the market for Terra Luna is very important because we do see all of this fluctuations. We do see all of these temporary drops. And if we just let these drops pass by without actually taking advantage of them, you're probably not making yourself a lot of favor. We can do better than this, right? Why not ride the waves to a certain degree, right? Nobody can time this perfectly, right? Nobody can sell exactly here and buy exactly here. But if we define something that at least historically worked pretty well in the past, it might potentially still work in the future. That's the idea, right? The structure of the market or the psychology of the people might not have changed that much over time. And so if we find something that returns a performance like this, then it's it's not entirely unreasonable, at least that's my assumption, it's not entirely unreasonable that this will to a certain degree continue. Maybe not as well as it has done here in the simulation, but hopefully still somewhat positive. Now buying low and selling high is easier said than done. And there is a lot of different approaches, right? One approach, for example, is to simply just draw trend lines on charts, right? And try to see, okay, we are appreciating by a certain rate and so when we are really shooting up, maybe we should sell. When we are really depressed or going sideways for quite a while, maybe we should buy. The problem, in general, this idea is not bad, right? It's very commonly used. And so sometimes we even get this self-fulfilling prophecy kind of effect, right? When a lot of people are not willing to sell over here and many people buy, this will just become self-fulfilling. People just push up the price. But the problem with this approach is we can't really test this, right? We can't really say, would we really have drawn this kind of a trend channel here in October already, right? Would we have done this or would we have drawn something completely different? And so you can't really backtest this. You can't really simulate this. You don't really know what you would have done in this particular situation. And so what I personally like to do, I like to have quantifiable approaches, mathematically derived approaches that help us gauge where the general momentum might go. And the most straightforward way is to simply look at moving averages, but not in the common way. So when we go here on tradingview.com and we select the moving average, we get this thin line over here, right? This blue line, I'm going to make this a little bit thicker. And then we've got a length and the length determines how much noise does this moving average take. So let's say we've got a pretty close moving average, then this line goes up and down pretty aggressively. If we've got a moving average with a longer duration, we can see this smoothens things out to a certain degree, right? So when we look, for example, here at the 40 day moving average, we have a pretty constant increase and decline. And we could potentially use this as one of the signals to buy and sell, right? We could, for example, follow the trends. We could say we want to be in the market whenever the price is above the moving average, such as over here and then we would have sold right let's say over here and we would not endure this entire crash so the magic with this approach is to find the ideal duration. Should we take, say, the 60-day moving average? Should we take the 40-day moving average? And my personal approach to this is to simply adjust this duration based on the asset you're looking at. What historically worked relatively well, so in this case, 60 days seems to be relatively fine. And what does somehow distill the positive movements somewhat accurately from the negative movements? So outside of the market over here, inside the market over here, 
here. And currently, when we look at this moving average, we would again be comparatively bullish. Now, what you can also do is you can look at exponential moving averages. Pretty much the same idea with a little twist though. So let's look at this line. Let's also take the 60 day and let's color this in red, for example. Now, what's the difference here? The exponential moving averages take the recent data more into account. So when you've got 60 days of data with the simple moving average, every single price would be weighted equally in order to get this moving average price. With the exponential moving average, you look at the recent data and you overweigh this data, right? So what happened 60 days ago isn't that important. We really want to look at what just recently happened. And so when you compare these two moving averages here, you see that the red line tends to be somewhat closer to the prices, right? It reacts a bit quicker. It's not as smooth. So this is really a matter of preference. You can also simply use the exponential moving average and adjust this. What I've done on this channel for some assets, so for example, for Bitcoin and Ethereum is I have backtested actually what works the best. I haven't done that backtest for moving averages here for Terra Luna, but at some point in time, I might. For Bitcoin, by the way, the best moving average, the simple moving average, is the 23 day. So when we look at Bitcoin and you want to time the Bitcoin market, your best bet, historically speaking, is the 23 day moving average. So this is now the Bitcoin price, just for reference. And currently, the situation isn't very clear, right? Sometimes we go above, sometimes we go below. We are somewhat in a sideways trading range. So really, we are currently in a volatile situation without a lot of decisions. Now, moving averages, that's probably somewhat boring, right? You've probably seen this hundreds of times in other videos. Let's look at something a bit more fancy, how we could potentially time the bottoms and the tops. So what you want to look at first is the Bollinger Bands. So again, we click over here to add our indicators and we enter Bollinger Bands. And there we go. And this is a bit more of a reactive strategy, right? This is trading a bit more actively. And the idea is that the price somewhat moves within those bounds, right? When we are relatively low, one might potentially buy. When we are potentially high here, one might consider selling. And of course, this doesn't work perfectly, right? Sometimes we're just at this higher band for quite a long time. Sometimes we're at the lower band for quite a long time. So it doesn't perfectly time it, but still it gives us somewhat of a range. How does this all work in terms of mathematics? How is this calculated? We've got a moving average in the middle, right? So in this case, the 20 day, and then we've got something called a standard deviation. So what this formula is doing is it looks at the last 20 days and it looks at how volatile was the price? How much did it move historically speaking? If it didn't move much, then the band, the width of the band will be relatively narrow. So for example, over here, right? We were pretty much going sideways for a while. The width of the band is pretty narrow. When we do crash, however, when we go really, really steep, then the width here is very, very wide, simply by anticipating that volatility is high, that the price might shoot anywhere. And so this is where the Bollinger Bands try to come up with a certain trading range. Now, what I want to focus on for the rest of this video is the RSI, the Relative Strength Index. It's personally my favorite indicator to gauge if we are currently overbought or oversold. So that's this indicator over here. What I like about the RSI is that it gives us really clear indications on where we potentially see an extreme. So the RSI is moving according to the pace. How quickly are we going up or how quickly are we going down? So if you're going up very quickly, we might be overbought, right? There might be a lot of hype and then afterwards we might somewhat decline or at least go sideways. If we are very low over here, we might be comparatively depressed, right? And then we could potentially go up from here. Notice how the lowest value here on the RSI in this entire time window was also comparatively one of the best buying opportunities. That's, I think, the strength of this RSI. Not a lot of indicators would tell you to buy exactly on the day where we are really the lowest compared to what happened in the recent past or compared to what happened after that signal. So that's the general idea. When we want to buy low and sell high, it's good to have a strategy. It's good to go on this with a systematic approach, something where we could also measure the performance, something that's not as subjective as just drawing lines on a chart, right? That's pretty subjective. But the RSI is a raw calculated number directly derived from the price. So is the moving average. So that's, I think, a way to keep out all of those emotions, right? When you're trading, there are emotions involved. Money is flowing in. 
you see that money going up or down, you might not do the most rational decision, but when you've got a very fixed trading rule set, then you can completely eliminate the emotions. Simply make sure when setting something like this up that you don't overtrade, right? That you keep your cost low and that you don't interfere with the strategy, that you simply just follow whatever you thought was the best, historically speaking. Buying the dip in Terra Luna. Why would we even consider such a strategy when over the long term the price is going up very nicely, right? I don't even know how big of a number that is if you look at the entire history here this is definitely a very very nice rise so why would you try to time the market here i think there's opportunity in dips because not everybody that sells during a crash like this right like here in may of last year not everybody that sells over here wanted to sell there is forced selling going on as well or there's at least automated selling going on so if you're betting on the Luna price appreciating and you've got some leverage, if you want to over anticipate, right, over participate. So if the price goes up by 10%, you will make 30%. If the price goes down by 10%, you will lose 30%. There are these kinds of instruments in the market when you are exposed to something like this and then we see a drop of say 40% and you've got a leverage of 3x, then you have to sell, right? The centralized exchange will liquidate you. It will take all of your money. And so this then will incur further selling, which might then in total lead to these more than 70% drops. And so that's one mechanism, right? We want to take advantage of something like this. If people have to sell, we want to buy the dip and make 80% in just a very short period of time. The other reason why people might be selling is simply because they are risk mitigating. For example, you might consider to set yourself a stop loss somewhere around here and then instruct your exchange to automatically sell whenever the price falls below a certain threshold. And so then we've simply got, again, cascading sales that continue to depress the prices and you want to buy those prices, right? You want to buy low and sell high. So there's opportunities in crashes. The issue though is we want to be systematic about about buying and selling those dips, right? You don't just want to buy the dip and see it further falling, buying the dip and just losing. Unless, right, this is now a very funny picture over here, but you could still have bought the dip and then just sold directly afterwards, right? A lot of these were actually opportunities, even in a chart like this. If you know when to sell, then even buying the dip in such a chart can make money. And I will go more into this in detail when we look at return charts such as this, right, where we buy the dip based on those mechanical rules, then you can even make money when the overall market, when the overall asset tends to decline. You simply have to sell quickly enough and you have to know when, historically speaking, the best time to sell is. And so what's important from my point of view is to have some kind of systematic approach over here, right? To stay in the driver's seat, not to be led by emotions and to simply just buy on a whim, but to have something predefined, a predefined set of of rules that historically worked well that you then want to use to hopefully perform positively for this in the future. Now, I personally, I like to use the RSI for this, right? So when we click here in trading view, we enter the relative strength index. We add this to the chart. I like to use this kind of indicator because it does work quite well historically for a lot of crypto assets. When we look, for example, at this chart over here, right? This duration, the lowest the RSI has been over here was also the lowest point in the price chart. So that's encouraging, right? You want to buy when when this RSI is low, you would have picked the best day in this example to get this dip to then afterwards profit from further growth, right? Those are the kinds of opportunities we look at. But what I think is important here is to see what kind of duration should we actually take. And this is where most people use the RSI, from my opinion, the wrong way. And I will try to illustrate this with an example. Here, look at this chart over here. I have removed now all of the labels on this chart, right? We don't have a price, we don't have a duration. And so I want you to kind of think, how long do you think is this chart actually? Is this chart showing maybe the price development of a single day? Does it show the price development of a week, of a month, of a year? What kind of price development do we see over here? What kind of duration? So that's chart number one. Let's now look at chart number two. So there we go. This is chart number two. Do you think this chart is 
longer or shorter in duration compared to the prior chart? If your answer is that the second chart is shorter in duration, then you are right. And I think you might have gotten this intuitively, right? I hope you picked the second chart. The reason why I think you could have picked that is because of the volatility. If we look at how much is the price moving, right? How much is it going up and down without a clear direction? We can see this on short time frames. So there seems to be some kind of a mean over here, a mean price, a reference point that people might have for what this asset might be worth. And then we're simply just overshooting and undershooting every now and then. When we look at a longer time horizon, so let me quickly show you here how long this is. This is the hourly chart and we are looking here at approximately four days of data. When we now zoom out and we look at this instead, we can see the fluctuations here, they are way more muted, right? They are way smaller. And what actually tends to be the main driver of price is trend. It's trend, right? It goes up sometimes, it goes down sometimes, but it's not fluctuating that erratically compared to the very short period. And that's why I think when you buy the dip, it's probably best to use this RSI on the hourly time frame. So not to use it on the daily time frame because the daily time frame is mainly looking at several months of data, right? Where we have trends, but the overshooting and undershooting, it happens on shorter time periods. So when we look at the hourly chart, we get, I think, way more reliable trading signals. Here, let's look at this historically. Let's take a low value over here. Let's say we would take, say, something around 22 or so. Then we would have bought, for example, over here, right? A strong undershooting. Then we sell some time later, right? We don't really know yet. How long should we hold until we sell? In this case, it would have been 37 hours, then we continue, then we see here again a pretty low level and the price didn't appreciate that much afterwards, right? But it still appreciated somewhat, in this case after 33 hours by 5%. And so it goes on, we can always buy during very depressed prices. And now the actual question is what kind of a threshold should one take, right? Should we already buy, say, when this hourly RSI is below 30? Should we wait until it goes below 20? And then when we do buy, how long should we potentially hold, right? What historically was the average duration for a recovery of the price after such a crash. And as always, I'm a fan of doing this systematically. If you so far enjoy this kind of content, don't forget to subscribe because I publish videos regularly. Now, let me show you a strategy of Terra Luna of buying the dip that actually works, that produced this kind of a result over here. The idea is that you buy when the hourly RSI is below a certain threshold and that you then sell after a fixed period of time. That's the idea. Most of the time you are outside of the market, we simply go horizontal here with the capital line, but sometimes we do trades and when we do them, we tend to on average make money. Now, how low should this threshold over here be and how long should we hold, right? If we go say below the 21 RSI and we would have bought over here, in this specific case, it would have been the best to sell after say 31 hours, right? But what's the typical best approach here? What kind of dip should we actually buy? And then how long should we actually hold? And what kind of expected return can we get from this? How often does this actually work? I've got very interesting data, very interesting results. I've simulated buying and selling. I've run the back test to find out what works the best when buying the dip for Terra Luna. So that was the big idea over here. We want to optimize and quantify buying the dip and taking advantage of oversold conditions. Now I've got four sets of charts over here. This is the first set of chart and this shows on the x-axis our holding duration in hours. Right? So how long are we going to hold once the hourly RSI is below a certain level and then what kind of a return can we expect after purchasing? Now, this does not include any trading fees, right? This is just pure price comparison. And so this chart over here shows the trading performance according to the 35 RSI threshold. We can see 
we do make quite a bit of money, right? In say the first 24, 25 hours, then it somewhat levels off, right? And the money that we make in 24 hours using the 35 RSI is approximately 2% per trade. Now let's move this hourly RSI, right? Let's go from 35 further and further down. Let's be more selective in our trades. Let's not buy as often, but hopefully make more money per single trade because we want to be somewhat on the safe side, right? We don't want to just get 2% return. And so let's go down with this RSI threshold of 35. This is the return with 34 threshold. This is 33. This is 32. And here we can already see at this point over here, we are looking at almost two and a half percent per trade. And this corresponds again to 25 hours of a holding period. The gain we do afterwards, after the oversold condition has somewhat leveled out, is neutral to negative. Now let's further go down with the threshold. This is now 31 RSI. We are now looking at 3% per trade. Again, the recovery is pretty much one day from from the signal. Then we go to 4% return per trade, 4.5, 4 4.7, and now already at 6% for every single trade using the 26 RSI threshold. Now I've done a similar analysis for Phantom, for the FTM token. And this was actually the best result for Phantom. The 26 RSI threshold with 26 hours of holding period, which is pretty good here for Terra Luna as well. But what's interesting is that once we become more selective with Terra Luna, we actually even get better returns. So let's continue this chart series over here. And with the 23 RSI threshold, we see already 7.5% return after maybe 29 hours. And so this continues. The 22 RSI threshold is really, really high. But then with 21 and going forward, it goes down again. So then we are not trading often enough. We are too selective. We might not necessarily make good returns on average. The sample size is simply too low, right? Once we go very low on this hourly RSI, we rarely trade. We trade maybe once a month, maybe even less than that. And so the backtest can't really get a conclusive idea of how the price develops after such a signal. We need more signals to get a proper chart. And so what kind of a threshold would I use? It really depends how often you want to trade. I think 22 with such a long holding period is probably not ideal. I think maybe 23, maybe 24 in terms of threshold is best and then waiting for as short as you possibly can, right? I would not wait to get this point over here and be in the market for an additional three hours. I would rather get the return that pretty much consistently rises because the longer you are in the market, potentially the more kind of risk you might be exposed to, right? This is another set of chart that we are now going to look at as well. Now here's the next set. This is showing the probability of success when making such a trade. So this is our success rate. How often does this actually work? On the left side, we've got our percentage. How often does it work? And here on the right side at the bottom, we've got our holding period. And then again, we've got several charts depending on what kind of threshold we take. And so what we would expect now is that the more selective we get with our trades, right, the lower this RSI threshold goes, the more potentially this line here should move upwards. The higher these numbers here on the left should be, the more successful on average we are, right? We are more selective. And so let's again flick through this and let's maybe first of all notice where this chart is ranging. It's ranging between 56% success and maybe 51, which is still better than random, right? I want to say that this 35 RSI threshold is not high at all. We get very often a lot of signals over here, but still it does outperform just throwing a coin. It's better than 50-50, right? This is where the 50-50 line would be. All of those holding durations, they outperform just throwing a coin. But let's see if we can get this higher, right? We want to have more than 55% success rate. And so let's be more selective over here. Once we go here to the 30 RSI threshold, we now see we are hovering between 50% and 60%. Let's get more selective. Now we are looking at the 25 RSI, which does go all the way up to 64% probably. And then with 23 and 22, we don't see that much of an improvement. Now, when we looked at the return charts, right, what was pretty good in terms of RSI threshold was around 24 approximately, right? 24, 23, and a holding duration of say, 
25, 26 hours. With that kind of a strategy, so let's maybe take this data point over here, that's a holding period of 28 hours. With that kind of a strategy, we would have made historically 62% roughly in winning trades. Now, nobody knows if this will continue, right? Nobody knows if this is a stable result, but given the historical performance per trade, I think this is quite promising. Not too many of those signals, depending on holding duration, are below 50%. So we do have a positive bias here. We do have a success bias, and that's exactly what we want. We want to get positive returns no matter how long we hold, simply to see that this strategy works in many contexts, and this is not just like overfitting the data, right? We want to get broad success with many different parameters. And so that's what we need to do in order to gain in two thirds of the cases in order to make 6% return for every single trade. That's simply what we have to do. Buy whenever the hourly RSI is below 24 and then hold for a bit over one hour. Buy whenever the hourly RSI is below 24 and then hold for a bit over a day, maybe 26, 27, 28 hours, something like that, that historically speaking would have worked the best for buying the dip in Terra Luna. Making money in bear markets with Terra Luna. So of course it makes sense to buy the dip when the price tends to go up, right? To buy whenever the hourly RSI is comparatively low over here, right? When we buy whenever the hourly RSI is below 24 and we hold for a little bit over one day, then we would get on average more than 6%. And this kind of a strategy would have worked quite often, right? It would have worked in almost two thirds of the cases. So buying the dip, buying whenever this indicator here is pretty low and then holding for a bit over a day. Of course it worked for Terra Luna because Terra Luna simply just went up all the time. But how would it be if we are in a bear market? And the problem is, in order to find this out, we can't really look at Terra Luna. We can't really take this chart here as reference point because even though the capital development of this strategy is relatively constantly appreciating, we still didn't have a major correction in Terra Luna, at least in the recent past. So does this work in a bear market? Does it make sense to buy when the price suddenly crashes and then sell a bit after one day? So to find this out, I looked at Cardano because Cardano did not have a very great time. Here, let's look at the long-term ADA chart. ADA was at three US dollars and now is at 80 cents. So we did have for quite a while a very, very bad ride over here, more than 70% of a loss over more than half a year. Now this backtest, this simulation of buying and selling whenever the hourly RSI is low, I made this backtest for the last one and a half years roughly. So I started here in beginning of 2021. And so for this simulation, we both have a positive market as well as a prolonged bear market. So does it make sense to buy those dips over here when we are low and then sell one day from that dip? And we're gonna use, as mentioned, the hourly chart for that. We're gonna use the hourly relative strength index and we buy whenever we are below the threshold of 24 or maybe another threshold. Let's look at all the different thresholds over here for the strategy for buying the dip in Cardano because maybe from that we can infer in case Luna doesn't appreciate that much anymore if that strategy would still hold up. And so just to recap, this is again our return after buying with Terra Luna, right? Buying below the 24 RSI threshold and holding for a bit over a day, more than 6% return expected. And so this is the same chart for Cardano with the 24 RSI threshold. Our expected return per trade is a bit over 5%, 5.4% maybe. And our holding duration again is a little bit over one day. So a very similar pattern what about the capital development? The capital development over time for Cardano with the strategy looks like this. Very encouraging, I think. This is one and a half years of data. This was the price development during that time. So half of the time period, we are basically just going straight down from $3 to less than a dollar. But at the same time, 
the capital development for Cardano with buying the dip and selling relatively quickly after that dip, it's still appreciated. So this works even during bear markets, at least it seems to work, right? Nobody knows, nobody has a crystal ball, but at least just trying to cross check this, does this only work in bull markets? The answer is for Cardano at least, it also worked in bear markets. Now the issue is to always monitor this properly, right? These are hourly charts. So you would have to look at this chart all the time in order to find out are we currently low on this hourly RSI. But for that, I've got a solution over here with the Bitcoin Strategy Premium Alerts channel. So this Telegram channel, it sends automatic messages whenever the hourly RSI falls below certain values. So in this case, 20 for several cryptocurrencies. I'm also going to add the alerts for 24. So we've got that. We've also got similar alerts for a selection of stocks. If you need other cryptocurrencies over here, simply feel free to ask this in the premium chat. You can also ask me any other questions in that premium chat. So if you're not yet aware, the website is thebitcoinstrategy.com. Link is in the video description. And over here, you can either sign up monthly or you can get two months for free to sign up yearly. Now, if you do want to make your own backtest, your own simulation of buying and selling, there are separate tutorial videos on this. So the way I built actually this simulation, it is described in one of the videos over here, RSI short-term trading with Luna and Cardano. And we've also got a statistics library where you can directly download the Excel sheet. So you can just just replace the price data and then make your own simulation of trading according to that strategy. But of course, the videos, they also show you how to change the strategy in case you want to do something else in case you don't want to use the hourly RSI, for example. Now, granted, this is a very active strategy, right? And it's kind of like making money by working actively for it. It's not necessarily long-term investing. So if you want to look at the price a little bit less actively, maybe only once per week, and you want to be a bit more conservative, so for example, buy and sell Bitcoin. In that case, this video over here is the right one for you. Again, it's got a backtest. It has backtested the best weekly moving average. So you only look at the price once a week. And based on that, you can statistically find out if you are more likely to go up or down in Bitcoin. Of course, nobody has a crystal ball, but at least it's an approach that historically worked the best for Bitcoin. So you definitely don't want to miss that video over here, the backtest for the weekly moving average for Bitcoin. Thanks for watching and see you in that video. Bye-bye.